Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the theater. There is a common idea between authors, writers, and poets that you don't truly know what you think until you open up a journal or a blank document and begin to write. The intricacies of our personality, our opinions, and perhaps even sides to ourselves previously undiscovered reveal themselves to us on the page. But it would be silly to think that the powers of self-reflection belong to writers alone. Introspection is available to everyone. Working with one's hands, spending time in nature, say, are perfectly adequate methods of exploring all the nooks and crannies of our psyches. The trouble is, most everyone has a dark secret, a memory, something they've done that they prefer to let rot in a cage somewhere in their minds. Sometimes it's something they want to do, a desire, a taboo, or simply a moral, a whispering of evil that must be contended with. Most people have this sense, when discovering this about themselves, to control these ideas rather than explore them, not just for their own well-being, but for the good of others. Then there are those who lack such empathy, people referred to as psychopaths, and they are considered dangerous not merely because the ideas they harbor, but because this clear distinction that they might actually act on them. It is a strange world we live in, wherein all the difference between becoming a murderer or a mailman may simply be a few tangled wirings in the brain. One day, we may look upon psychopathy much in the way we look upon pneumonia or any other bodily disease. We'll have a pill that we take, or an injection, perhaps, to effectively cure it. And having fully recovered from the disorder, the ex-psychopath might say, my god, could those really have been my thoughts? And we will have entered an uncanny reality where the monster dwelling inside them becomes just as terrifying to the individual harboring it as it was to everyone else. But today is not that day. My name is Harlequin Grimm, and you are listening to the stories of monsters whose voices are lost in history. And this is Mania. Only seven years following the Whitechapel murders, which so birthed the harrowing name Jack the Ripper, was a singularly odd and gruesome several weeks in the spring of 1895 in San Francisco. Although there were only two victims, they bore similar characteristics of Jack's. They were abused, mutilated, and left in places which begged for some public discovery soon after the fact. And yet, whatever similarities between these two killers can be found, they seem purely circumstantial, coincidental. This is all just to say that the subject of this episode did not have the guile that our dear Jack had though he shared his inclinations. Strangely enough, our story begins at a church. The Emmanuel Baptist Church, that is, on Bartlett Street of the Mission District. Nestled between homes and shops, the three stone archways guide the eyes to the rising of the church's belfry and steeple, the iconic shape which denotes such places of worship. Unlike Gothic cathedrals, the Baptist Church had a humility in its construction. It was not terribly large or commanding. Even still, this quaint place of worship would come to house some terribly large miseries. Blanche Lamont, in the true dawn of her adulthood at 20 years of age, had recently moved from Montana to further her education. Her aunt, Mrs. Noble, took her in her home on the 21st Street of Mission District. Like any good standing individual in the community at that time, Lamont was an active member of the local church. Soon after her arrival, she came to know the assistant superintendent, one William Henry Theodore Durant. But well before Lamont arrived in San Francisco, a rumor had been bubbling up in the underground community of sex workers. The rumor was that a repeat customer enjoyed the slaughter of birds during the transaction. This customer would 
after cutting the bird's heads, spilled the blood all over his own body. And yet such rumors never reached the ears of people who perhaps would have benefited from the information. It was well known that Theodore preferred the company of young women who attended the Emmanuel Baptist Church, he himself being a young adult. Many of the women were confronted by him with sexual propositions, but too embarrassed and uncomfortable to share, these rebuffed approaches were often kept between Theodore and the churchgoer. Perhaps they would have reacted differently, or even gone to the police, had they known what the prostitutes knew about Theodore. With no notion to any of this, Miss Lamont caught on that Theodore was looking for a partner, and after the two met, it didn't take long for them to start dating. It was the early afternoon of April 3rd, 1895, when Lamont and Theodore met at the electric trolley stop on Polk Street. Throughout the ride, the two behaved as any young couple might. Admittedly, the advances were coming from the gentleman, and not very much the lady. Theodore had his arm draped around her, his hand playing with the lacing of her gloves, while he murmured into her ear. When they left the trolley on 21st Street, they entered the Emmanuel Baptist Church together. One can say, almost beyond a shade of doubt, that the young woman, walking beneath those arches, wasn't considering the idea that this day was her last one on earth, let alone her final two hours, and that the very place which would see her pass from it was one considered to be sacred. Theodore used his position in the church to leverage a place of romance, the belfry. Unlike the other women, he felt confident that Lamont wouldn't refuse his approaches. At this time, there was only one other in the church, the choir director, George King, who was practicing hymns on the organ. The peculiar timbre of that instrument breathed into the space its sense of habitual, serene security. It is that often lacking musical interpretation of what holiness and solemnity might sound like. Theodore led her up to the belfry, and if you are unfamiliar with that term, it is also known as the bell tower. This time it was Lamont playing with her gloves. There was a look in Theodore's eyes, a hunger, not unlike the sexual eagerness she'd seen in boys throughout her adolescence, yet there was something else about Theodore. A stubbornness, perhaps even the tiniest bit of poorly concealed discontent, as if whatever was about to happen was well-deserved. And up the steep, creaking steps they went. Miss Lamont had never been in such a place before. She was surprised to find the beams holding everything up were unlike the outside. Here the wood was rough, unfinished, bare, and without a speck of paint. All the practicality of architecture and none of its finished beauty. The belfry sounded so romantic, promising a view of the city, a place of privacy, but this, this was a cold, damp attic by all rights. In the belfry's numerous rising joints to support the steeple, there were symmetrical and encircling, almost suggesting the image of a birdcage, and Miss Lamont, the bird. It wasn't long before a small weight in her stomach grew heavier, so burdensome it sapped her attention and made time pass both too quick and yet with a dizzying sluggishness about it. She searched Theodore's puzzling expression. A man who she was just now discovering was looking less and less familiar with each passing second. And he, too, was gazing back at himself through her eyes, his own reflection looking rather like a stranger in her dilated pupils. All it took was the turning of Miss Lamont's head. A simple gesture of her discomfort at his leaning in closer. This was the pivotal action which allowed Miss Lamont to see that hidden side of Theodore, a corruption so concentrated that, no matter the rest of his nature, it rendered the whole of his being, in that moment, demonic. And to see this side, this demonic embodiment, it would cost Miss Lamont everything.
Just three hours after they had been seen together on the trolley, Theodore descended from the belfry. Trembling down the final steps, he was stopped by the choir director, just as he was leaving for the day. Theodore was pale, shaken, his eyes frantic. He asked George to fetch him medicine from a nearby store. Something to calm his nerves, he'd said. And by the time George returned, Theodore already seemed more himself, though he took the tranquilizer gratefully. Before it was dark, Mrs. Noble, worried, came looking for her niece during the middle of the evening prayer service. Theodore told her that Lamont had left some time ago and hadn't returned. He promised to stop by after the service to drop off a book for her, assuring Mrs. Noble that she'd be back. Later that night, when Theodore showed up at her home, he found Mrs. Noble's fear for her niece worsened tenfold, but what he offered her wasn't consolation or merely the promised book, rather a callous theory that Lamont may have been kidnapped and forced into prostitution. Mrs. Noble looked into the same dark eyes that Lamont wondered at just hours before. What had Theodore been doing when George King left to fetch him medicine? What had Theodore gained in that? What he'd gained was time. Enough time to stash Miss Lamont's body in the very place where he strangled her, to jam the lock into the belfry. Enough time to come to terms with the fact that Lamont was no bird. She was human, and unlike birds, her murder would raise more than just rumors. Though he was standing just before Mrs. Noble, Theodore was distant. She was always, um, very persuadable, he said. Not exactly the soft words sought after in such a distressing moment. And besides the murder and the rumor of the bird, this is one of the most glaring hints that something in Theodore's head wasn't wired right. Albeit crudely solving one problem by offering a red herring, Theodore had others. It was a beautiful day. The day he strangled Lamont in the bell tower and shoved her body between two beams, with her head wedged between more wood still. The weather in San Francisco was beyond temperate that day. It was sheer perfection, a spring day in California, and that meant that dozens of people saw him on the trolley with Lamont. So many that the police would have a literal stop-by-stop -stop description of his behavior with her. Worse yet were the witnesses that had seen him enter the church with Miss Lamont, and none having ever reported her leaving. Despite this, when the police questioned him and searched the church, he gave the same suggestion he gave Mrs. Noble. And without a body, and no evidence, Miss Lamont remained a missing person. But that didn't clear the police's suspicion of Theodore. As I said before, there were countless witnesses able to place him with Lamont in the hours leading up to her disappearance. But somebody in the town offered something a bit more insightful into their suspect. One day, a woman had seen a man alone in the church library. The man was standing still, she said. So still that she thought at first it might have been a statue. Only the man was completely naked and alone. That man was Theodore Durant. The nights following Lamont's murder brought a little sleep for Theodore. He would lay awake thinking about her body in the bell tower. What it felt like squeezing the last gasps of oxygen from her throat. The belfry was well insulated, cold. It would give him time to move the body once he mustered the boldness. It was strange to think of her held upright by the wooden beams, alone in the cold, dark, her eyes open and peering into nothing. But the imagery didn't haunt Theodore. More shocking than any rumor was this deeply held secret, that such images and memories were like treasures to him. There was something else, too, the confirmation of his alarming actics with birds and prostitution. Miss Lamont's strangling wasn't premeditated. But that didn't mean he didn't enjoy it. Like many killers before him, a desire was maturing in the heart of Theodore. Illogical, immoral, reprehensible, and yet to him, natural. 
irresistible, in fact. It was only nine days before he was ready to kill again. On April 12th at 7 p.m., Theodore took another woman he had been courting simultaneously, Minnie Williams, to the church. They were seen fighting on the steps. The argument was loud enough that a passerby intervened until at last they stopped. Theodore had been pleading with Minnie, requesting something, uh, a request that Minnie resisted. When they did finally enter the church together, it was under the shadows of an encroaching night. Again, nine days, nine days was all it took for Theodore to fully realize this urge of his, and to let the maws of that supposedly holy place swallow up his second victim. But just how he murdered Minnie was the real surprise. And so, I will have it revealed to our listeners in the very manner in which the body was discovered. The next day was Easter Sunday. It was a time for tradition, ritual, and decoration. One of the parishioners went to a closet to fetch supplies for the evening. In reaching for the handle to the closet, she noticed an odd smell coming from it, something rank and foul, like human excrement in the open air. When she opened the door, she didn't find more prayer books. The supplies inside had been moved by someone the night before. Moved so as to accommodate the mutilated, stiffened body of Minnie, her wrists slit, and her mouth stuffed with her own undergarments. Still in her chest, the blade which finally killed her, its handle broken off and missing, her blood long since coagulated around the steel. In opening the door and thereby removing its support, the body slumped over, and due to the gases building in her stomach and the unfortunate angle by which she was propped up, Minnie's corpse let out a long gurgling croak as though still alive. The parishioner's howling for help was cut short from the buckling of her legs and her fainting before help arrived. There were bloodstains along the walls of the closet and, of course, in a large pool on the ground around her. A little fact for those interested, blood doesn't solidify all at once. After an individual dies, blood can remain its vibrant color and hue and texture in the first days of decomposition depending on the environment. Blood, which is exposed to the air, will start to stagnate, of course, but blood kept inside the body will pour out of wounds in its standard liquid form. Thusly, if a body is moved after it has died, it will remain scarlet and ever-staining as if they were just alive. Thusly, due to the many stab wounds inflicted on her body, it was a very messy Easter Sunday for the authorities that came to collect her. As soon as Minnie was found, the police had a hunch that Lamont's body would not be far off. It didn't take long for one of them to remember that they had neglected to break into the belfry previously, after finding that the lock had been jammed. This time, they would rectify that oversight. And there, they found Lamont, her body upright and stuffed between two pillars of wood. Why Theodore had placed her upright is anyone's best guess. Investigators noted that this along with a low temperature in the belfry, would slow decomposition. When they found her, she was white as marble stone, but upon bringing her down to the lower levels of the church, her skin blackened. Upon meeting the warmer air, as though making up for lost time. Suffice it to say, Theodore Durant's arrest soon after was swift. The police had too many witnesses. On testimony alone, the evidence was damning. Thus the trial brief. Though the whole country was eager for every word of that trial, there were others who were eager for different reasons. Just like Ted Bundy, Theodore had his fair share of lady suitors who wrote letters and pined for his attention. Yes, I am sorry to say, the phenomena of fawning over murderers is nothing new. Personally, I just find it unamusing. It doesn't seem edgy or fun or interesting. The romanticization of a dangerous person, perhaps, is understandable. But writing letters and getting one's feelings tangled or rushes of blood outside of mere fantasy, no, 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 that is where I draw the line. 
In any case, we have become distracted from the story, but as you can perhaps imagine, there is very little left. It was the noose for Theodore. He sustained his denial throughout the trial, all the way up to the gallows, good lad, on January 7th, 1898, and his last words, It is they, not I, who have blackened the name of California, were uttered before his feet swung before a crowd of two hundred. But judging by their reaction, it wasn't very compelling. Durant's parents enjoyed a fine meal beside their son's body the same day, resting in a coffin and delivered to their parlor after the execution. The press was there, words were recorded, and amongst them were the quiet murmurings of Theodore's mother, asking for another piece of toast between remarks shared with both her husband and newly deceased son. There were claims that she talked to the corpse all day and night so long as the body was in her home, which was customary at that time. If that is true, perhaps the little psychopathic apple didn't fall far from the tree. And you might feel the same after you hear this next detail. For if she really did talk to Theodore for all the days and nights that he was in her home, well then, that was nearly seven days, because it took almost a whole week for his parents to find a crematory willing to take the accursed body into their fiery retorts, and the one that finally did accept them was a several hours' journey away. It appears that not even morticians had the stomach for men such as Theodore, dead or otherwise. Though Theodore's story ended, that of the Emmanuel Baptist Church continued. There were calls for the building to be demolished on the grounds that it had forevermore been corrupted by the evils spilt there. These calls were denied, until, not soon thereafter, a pastor took his own life in the church. And then after that, another pastor was caught in a sexual scandal. And yet another pastor went on to become a murderer, though not within the church's confines. In total, that's three of the church's workers succumbing to some nefarious deed, and four if you are counting the sheer despair of a suicide. It later came about that the church was built on the grounds of a haunted home. In 1915, less than two decades later, logic finally caved to superstition. Even I, a staunch skeptic, must admit it seemed like a good idea. The church was demolished, and in its place, a row of homes were constructed, looking to outshine the bleak pasts and many deaths which they placed their foundations upon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming back to the theater. Presently, this theater is of the mind. But if you'd like to see this work grow and blossom, or simply express your appreciation for the stories, please consider heading over to patreon.com forward slash Harlequin Grimm. There you will find rewards such as early access to content, prints, future merchandise, and writings which only patrons can enjoy. And recently, I realize that the subscription model for Patreon can be a bit daunting, I understand. So if you're a listener looking to impart a one-time donation, I now have set up a Ko-Fi. That is ko-fi.com forward slash Harlequin Grimm. Any and all support of the show is greatly appreciated. I am so grateful to my patrons and everybody helping build this community. If you want to help out, but not by reaching into your pockets, word of mouth really is miraculous. Follow me on Instagram, share my content, connect with me and our community, and help build the grim theater that will one day exist outside the mind. Now let's continue with the show. One thing that I enjoy about Theodore's story is that it isn't particularly special, except of course for the fact that his murders took place in a church, and more startling still, he had the gumption to leave the bodies there. There wasn't really anything fabricated. There were some moments that were exaggerated, you can imagine, where I tried to see what was going on in Theodore's head as it seemed as though he was figuring things out in these very haphazard, panicked moments. There wasn't any real logic to it. Did he really expect to get away by leaving the bodies in the church? I think not. I think it was all just something he was figuring out. And this is exemplified by the detail that he was shocked. He was trembling after he strangled Lamont. He was coming to terms with what he had done. Given the bird and given what he did to Minnie, just a few days later, well, it also leads to the idea that he actually did enjoy it and he wanted to do more of it. But it is so strange because the way it started out seemed like an accident. It didn't seem as though he was willing to kill Lamont. Maybe there was even a part of him that thought he was 
going to be caught, and that's why he had committed his second murder in the same place. There was a detail that I left out that he was training in a branch of the military when he was arrested. He wasn't arrested long after he had killed Minnie. Uh, it was very easy for the authorities to find out which branch of the military he was training at, go find him and arrest him there. But he was in a branch of the military. I think perhaps that's why he was so cocky with the bodies. And yet, uh, lo and behold, it wasn't long after that he was executed. So yes, there's very little of this story that I had to fabricate. It was rather fantastic on its own. Now the detail with Lamont's skin blackening as she meets warm air, it sounds like it's something from a fictional story, but it really wasn't. That was another eye testimony. As some of you know, I worked in a mortuary for nearly a year, but I'm finding that my experience there is lacking. I don't know why that might have happened. The blood might have changed a little bit of color given where she was. And with the blood moving around in her body after she had been moved, it gave the appearance that her skin was blackening. And how many days she had been left up there, you know, a little over a week, that's quite a bit of time for a body to start rotting. Some real changes would have started to happen. That being said, my insight into Theodore's mind is of course pure conjecture. So all in all, this story is, is very little fiction and very much wholly the truth. So hold on to your hats, ladies and gentlemen, next time you go into a church with a... Uh, a assistant superintendent, whatever that may mean. Once again, I must thank you for listening to the Mania Podcast and returning to this little theater of ours. Again, I would appreciate it so much if you would take some time to leave a review or support my work in any way that you can. I would deeply appreciate it. Otherwise, merely your attention and continued interest in the show is actually more than I can ask. So thank you very much, and as ever, the theater is open to you.